All right. Hello, everybody. Today I am with Jason Raka, and we are going to talk about some dry needling things. We're going to talk about some physical therapy. And what's most interesting to me is Jason does a lot of visceral manipulation. So um, obviously super fascinated and interested about how the gut and inflammation and neurology affects pain, chronic pain, movement dysfunction, all those things. It, it's definitely an interest of mine. And um, so Jason and I met at a dry needling course. What's it been a week? Last week, week, week and a half. Yeah, yeah, yeah. something like that. A um, uh, week ago, and uh, we chatted a little bit, but of course, you never have enough time to, to talk. So uh, he was uh, nice enough to join us on a podcast so we could really sit down and chat about it. So Jason, thanks for thanks for joining me. Yeah, absolutely. Glad to do it. Um, can you just quickly introduce kind of yourself, your practice and, and what you do down there in Texas? Yeah. Uh, so uh, Jason Rocca, physical therapist. Um, I started a, a cash-based practice in the Fort Worth area, um, February of 2020. And then um, March of 2020 happened and everybody knows what happened then. And uh, so I just kind of kept it, kept it going at a low level. I had started off um, mobile, doing mobile visits anyway. So my overhead was really low. Um, saw like one to two a month. Um, and then a few months into 2020, it started to build a little bit. Uh, once it once we got into 2021 and it looked like we were going to not be shut down anymore, uh, then I ran into space. Um, and so I'm, I'm doing that part-time as it's building and then uh, still part-time in another clinic as well. Gotcha. So was COVID a th like on your radar when you decided to do this? No, no. I, so I had actually, I've been, I've been talking about doing this for years. Um, and actually the other company that um, I've been with that was part of what they were doing was mentoring me to do my own thing. Uh, so I, I've been with that other company about 10 years, had been, you know, doing meetings with the owners over the years. And uh, so when, when I decided to do it, it was January of 2020, I filed for my PLLC because I had the flu one week and I was stuck in a room and I was like, well, I'm just going to go ahead and get this done um, and started seeing patients in February and then oh, no clue that that was coming. And then even in March, right? Like in Texas, we didn't, we didn't really ramp up and, and start shutting down right away. So it was, it was like, well, what's going to happen with this? Yeah. I, I distinctly remember one patient in particular, we're like, maybe COVID is going to be a thing. I don't know what COVID yeah. is. And then it was yeah. like the next weekend, it was just the world shut down. And you're like, yeah. Oh my yeah. God. Um, yeah. so I can't imagine, you know, we were in it at that point, but I can't imagine starting and then, you know, days later. Yeah, gosh. So I know this only because it's, it'll be two years this weekend that everything shut down, like the world shut down because it shut down my, my birthday weekend and that's coming up uh, next birthday. week. And so it was like, happy birthday, the world <laughs> shut down. <laughs> Your party is canceled. Yeah. Uh, oh, that's fantastic. Um, so anyway, <laughs> I just, uh, it's just been such a crazy ride and to think we're still, um, I feel like we're on the other end of it now, but it seems, seems like it yeah. seems like we're getting close, but man, two years and it's still, so props to you for growing your practice in that, that period. That's, that's oh. no, no small feat to grow a cash practice and then to try to grow it through COVID is, uh, man, that's crazy. Yes. Yeah. So it sounds, you know, I was talking to, to Matt who hosted mm -hmm. us down there um, at Fort Worth Physical Therapy, and, and he was telling me a little bit about what you do from the visceral mm -hmm. standpoint. Um, it sounds like that's a pretty big part of your practice, correct? Yeah, yeah it's, it's become a big part of it for sure. So, so tell us a little bit, what is visceral manipulation? Who are the clients you see? Yeah. Um, like, what is that niche? Yeah, so, so viscera, um, for those that wouldn't know, like viscera just basically refers to our organs. Um, this room manipulation refers to um, mobilizing those organs. So the way I usually explain it like to a new client, um, I usually say, you know, uh, one of the things that I do is visceral manipulation. Um, you know, viscera refers to our organs and our organs um, have this type of tissue that surrounds them called fascia. We have fascia throughout the whole body. And then I'll use like an, like an orange analogy. I'll tell them, you know, it's like when you peel an orange, you know, the, 
you peel the orange peel off and you've got that white layer around the orange. That's like the thin layer of uh, fascia underneath our skin. And then you start to separate the orange and you've got those divisions that make it into slices. And that's like the deeper layers of fascia that go into the different muscles, muscle fibers around the nerves and, and then all, you know, around the viscera, so around the organs. Um, and those create ligaments and those ligaments attach them to other structures. Uh, sometimes it's other organs, sometimes it's muscle, sometimes it's bone. Um, and our body is, is designed in um, kind of this hierarchy where it's going to protect what's most important. Um, so, you know, organs more important than muscle and bone, uh, nerves more important than muscle and bone. And so, uh, you know, when those structures get tight, so, uh, you know, a common example I'll use is like, if the small intestines gets tight and I go to bend forward, you know, normally those would fold, move, get out of the way. If they get tight and they can get tight for various reasons, and we, we'll keep, we can get into all of that here in a little bit, but if they get tight, then my body's gonna say, hey, I don't wanna move that way. That's going to put pressure or compress the small intestines. So maybe I'm gonna bend a little bit differently. So then you start getting, stress and strain to a lot of the musculoskeletal structures that we find people come into the clinic with, you know, um, you know, disc herniations, muscle spasms, low back pain, hip pain, things like that. Um, so this real manipulation would then go in and use manual techniques, and they're very gentle, um, to help restore that mobility, to help the, uh, the tissue start to slide and glide a lot better. Yeah. So how, I'm trying to think of where we start this to, so that it makes sense for everybody. I know where I want to go. Um, yeah. Why do you think that those adhesions happen? If yeah. like, why does that visceral mobility decrease? Yeah. Um, so in a number of factors, right? Um, Cause we're, we're talking viscera would include the intestines, the large and small, the liver, the stomach, but it would also include things like the heart, the lungs, um, the thyroid, the, you can include maybe even the brain in that. So, so it depends on the region, but, um, you know, big ones that people I think really would understand pretty clearly is surgeries. You know, anytime you have say an abdominal surgery, um, that's going to go in and that's going to leave scar tissue. Um, uh, that's an easy one to, to grasp, um, trauma, direct trauma to an area. So a lot of times I'll tell people, like, if we're talking abdomen, we're talking things like, car accidents and the seatbelt went across you or, or the seatbelt across the chest and dealing with the heart and the lung mobility or, um, you know, uh, falls on the tailbone is a big one. Uh, that, that concussion wave that would go through you as you, as you hit the ground, uh, not to mention what it does to some of the pelvic structures. Um, so, those are the, so those are the big ones that are easier to grasp. Other things that I get into with, with clients when I start explaining is anything that would cause inflammation in your body. So now we get into autoimmune issues, um, anything that causes gut inflammation. So food sensitivities, uh, things like irritable bowel syndrome. Um, we know that there's this gut brain connection and largely through the vagus nerve. So now that opens up this this whole other world of anything that potentially causes brain inflammation can cause gut inflammation. And, so you might have some, some adhesion issues because of that uh, and vice versa. So, uh, I mean, it, it, it can be a number of things for sure. Yeah, that I think the surgery one is, is apparent, right? You have a scar, right. you have lesions, your body's going to heal that. And depending on how that immune response, response goes, you, you get different results. Um, when a client asks, and, and this is my, this is my uh, kind of current interest, is mm -hmm. why do you think gut inflammatory problems, call it, let's call it leaky gut. Yeah. Why do you think they cause some of those visceral adhesions or why are you seeing some of those mobility issues? Because that, that to me is, is a fascinating concept, right? Because mm -hmm. if you have inflammation, now you start to see abdominal guarding, you start to see tenderness in the abdomen, mm -hmm. the visceral things that you're working on. And now that changes everything, right? Changes core muscle activation, changes mm -hmm. posture, spine, run it down. Right. Right. Um, what, what do you think that mechanism is or why do you think that happens? Yeah. I mean, I think, I, I think you touched on a big one right there is, you know, when you start having the, the inflammation and we'll just keep kind of talking, say the abdomen, cause that's an easy place to kind of, uh, conceptualize it. But, um, you know, if you get inflammation, we, we know that inflammation will cause scar tissue inflammation in the muscle is going to it's like your body splinting that area and that lack of movement is going to cause adhesion. We, we know that same thing with the organs. So if you have 
inflammation, your body's going to do something to change the way that you move. It's going to, like you said, the tone might increase in uh, the muscles around it. The tone in the actual structure will increase. I mean, they're surrounded by fascia. We know uh, that fascia contracts. Um, there was a, a pretty important study, I think it was 2013, where they, they um, talked about how fascia contracts in a smooth muscle-like way. And so we know that when when an, an organ has an issue, whether it's a pathological issue, whether it's a mobility issue, that fascia around it will hug it. So if you can see my shirt, if I start to bind that area, like it's like it's fascia around an organ, it creates these lines of tension. And so when that happens, that changes the way we move. And so when, when we start changing the way we move, then we start putting the more stress and strain on the muscles, the joints, then in a way that they maybe weren't designed. And so then you, then you start looking at, well, is this more of a, a repetitive issue? You know, I've been sitting a different way. And so I've got more strain on me because I've been kind of offloading to avoid putting stress through something, or I'm, I'm bending a different way now over and over again, when I reach for the phone on my desk, you know, whatever the case may be. Um, so I, th I think largely it comes back to you know, we start seeing the the pain and the and the stress on these structures because of how our body's responding to protect itself from something deep or something else. Yeah, that that motor control, motor planning side of the altered movement pattern as a mm -hmm. result of, and I think we overlook that. I think we talk about it in like sports. You know, you yeah. you have a hip mobility restriction, so now you're throwing motions off because you can't rotate through the opposite hip. But I don't know that we talk about it in this scenario as maybe as much as we should, yeah. where hey, because you're having these abdominal restrictions in guarding, now you're avoiding that position, which is causing you to move this certain way. Um, and, and I think, and this is kind of a, a manual therapy interest of mine, the conversation of, is it the structure of the fascia that's the problem? Mm -hmm. Or is it the neural input that's mm -hmm. altering that motor pattern? And, and I don't know, I don't know that you can separate those, but I think there's right. probably a spectrum of it starts as some kind of fascial weird thing that turns into a motor programming, motor patterning issue um, is kind of my theory. Like something had to have started it, you know, like yeah. what started yeah. the, the change. Um, what are your thoughts on that? That kind of, is it the fascia? Is it neural? How do you separate those? Uh, um, you know, early on in, in my career, so yeah, that, no, that's a good point. It's yeah. that chicken or the egg, right? Yeah. Um, early, early on in my career. So I've been, uh, I'm in my 16th year now. So early on, I was very much more biomechanics focused. I think like a lot of outpatient orthopedic type uh, therapists would be, uh, even if they got into manual therapy, like that's, that's a largely the direction a lot of manual therapy programs go. And so that was my focus. So I would have said, it's the, it's the structure of the fascia. The longer I do this, the more I realize that a lot of what we do, no matter what kind of manual therapy we're practicing, no matter what how we're practicing, we're largely affecting the brain and the nervous system. So, uh, you know, fascia has mechanoreceptors; those are neural structures, and so something affects those mechanoreceptors. That's going to send information up to the brain. The brain's going to say, "We got to do something with that. Maybe we tighten up. Maybe we guard." So, so I think. I think the neural components probably, in my opinion, the neural components probably the bigger of the two. But um, but then you get into, you know, direct trauma surgeries. How much of that was the fascia getting injured, or do you say that, you know, because that fascia got injured, it's those neural structures that cause, you know? So I don't. Yeah, I agree with you. I don't think you can separate them. But I think all of what we do really is more we're seeing the effects we see because of how it's affecting the neural structures would be my, my opinion on that. I'm a hundred percent on board with you there. I, I, again, I do think there's something that triggered, like there's that initial input, right? The fascia is highly, the sensory innervation of the fascia is huge. Mm -hmm. So when you have a surgery, you have a trauma, you have inflammation, like that input through the nervous system has to be doing something. Right. But then ultimately it's the neural changes that, that I think we can have an effect on. And, and I think that kind of leads into this idea of visceral manipulation. I, it's not something I've been formally trained in. Um, I kind of assess it. I kind of mess yeah. with it a little bit. Uh, but most of the techniques are super gentle mm -hmm. that, that I've seen. Um, could you describe, like, from a manual therapy standpoint, when you put your hands on somebody and you're trying to do visceral manipulation, 
what are you looking for? What do you think you're accomplishing mm-hmm. with that? Yeah. Um, so I've, I've learned this room manipulations uh, through two different approaches. Um, and, and they're a little bit different. And so it depends on the approach I'm taking with that particular patient. But in general, um, you know, sometimes my, my approach with a patient, especially if they came specifically for this room manipulation, I'm going to go more the pure Baral Institute, this room manipulation route where they do osteopathic um, assessments. And so there's an osteopathic technique called listening. Um, where essentially you're loading the fascia with a very light pressure, and then you're feeling for as the as the fascia responds to that load, you, you can pick up on the lines of pull. So, you know, it sounds odd and it would probably look odd to a lot of people that don't know what's going on, but one of the ways, the main ways to kind of get a general idea of where to go is you put a light pressure on their head and then you just load it and then you come off and then you're, you're able to, it's like you, it's like you wake up that fascia and then you pick up on these, those lines of pull that we talked about. So, you know, I might do that and it might feel like, okay, that pulled down to the left side of the abdomen. And all that tells me is there's something on that left side of the abdomen that the body is saying, Hey, I, I need help here. It doesn't tell me what structure it just says it's something. And it may not be visceral. It may be that it's the psoas muscle, or it may be a, you know, a joint, but it tells me I need to go look more there. So, so in, in those scenarios, then I would go and look where that pool was. So let's say left side of the abdomen, then I do the same thing, but I, I'm more local. So I'm using, you know, other pressures around the area, trying to pick up on those lines of pool until you kind of pinpoint, okay, that pool was coming from that structure. Okay, that was the sigmoid colon. So the, the last, you know, the lower part of the large intestines. So then you start feeling around and you can feel mobility. You know, you know all tissues, all joints, you know, in, in our world, we talk about infill, right? But in a, in a client's mind, they don't know what that means. So I just tell them, you know, all tissue needs to have movement, right? And when it doesn't move well, it's got a harder feel to it. When it moves well, it's got this, this give to it, this springy feel to it. And so even the viscera are the same. So, you know, you can move those structures and if, if there's a hardness to it, or you feel like you run into a barrier, that's dysfunction. And so a lot of times that's, that's the route I'll go with it. I'll also use um, just a lot of your standard range of motion, functional movement tests as well. And so, you know, I might do like a rotation, you know, yeah, um, they might be standing and I'll, I'll rotate them one way and then the other and just feeling for, okay, what's, what's stopping that? Where am I feeling that stop it and go look at those different structures. And then, you know, anatomy comes into play at that point. Okay. It felt like it was getting stuck down here at the left side, but what's at that left side. And I start thinking, you know, what, what visceral structures, what joint structures, what nerve structures, what uh, muscles, you know, and you kind of start considering what, what feels like it's going on. It's so, uh, kind of off topic, but you know, you get to talk, I get to talk to people that are manual therapists and we're talking about viscera, but I've talked about everything. It's, it's so interesting to hear the similarities of, Mm. it is a little feel like it's touch, you know, you kind of feel that tone. And and I actually purchased uh, the book from Baral. Um, I haven't haven't read it as much as I probably should have, but I've I've been through it. Um, when you say you're pushing, like you're literally, you got hand on stomach somewhere, and then you're literally pushing head to see if it changes tone in the abdomen or uh, the region. None, no. So for the assessment, it's really, it's literally just hand on the head. And then well, that's you, all it is. Not like a compression test for a radiculopathy or something. No, no. Yeah. It's, it's literally it's, just it's like, hand on head. Like five grams of pressure, uh, like pretty light, right? Interesting. Um, enough to stimulate mechanoreceptors. Uh, now, not every client do I do that with. Like, you have to read the room, right? Like the first mm-hmm. visit, if somebody comes in and they don't know what I do, if they're just coming to me for back pain and I start putting my hand on their head, they're not coming back. Well, they might, but they're probably not, right? So, you. yeah. So usually I'll I'll go the other route with the movement test. I'm like, oh, did you feel that? That's kind of stuck here. And the first visit, I may not even work on that. Um, I might kind of ease them into that. And so that's where the other approach that that I tend to go to goes comes into play because it's it's, it's still gentle, but it's a little bit more hands-on. They can, you know, a lot of people just like to feel like you're doing something. And so if it's appropriate, then I'll, I'll, I'll be a little bit more, um, I don't want to say heavy handed, but I'll just be a little bit more direct with the treatments to it. Whereas where there are times that it's so subtle and indirect of a treatment that the patient's like, 
did you do anything? So, so I, I tend to be more direct with like, yeah. if I'm going to do like, I'm literally looking for tone kind of the, what you're describing. Yeah. And if I yeah. find tone, I kind of lean into it a little bit. Yeah, you're right. right. Um, you know, after pushing on people for a bunch of years, it almost feels like your hands take you there. Like, I don't know yes. that I have a yeah. strategy, but yeah. it's just kind of like, I'm close. Oh, there's some tension. Right. And you kind of, yeah, yeah. right. Kind of move towards it. Um, what makes you decide whether you're going to use a lighter technique versus a heavier technique? Yeah. Um, I, this would get into similarities about how the needling course, right. How you guys teach, how do you dose the needles? Right. Yeah. So it, it's going to depend on the patient, the uh, different factors they've had, uh, in their history. Um, you know, if I've got somebody that's coming in that, that are giving me a lot more indication that they're, they're more inflamed. Um, they've got a higher, um, they're, they're, they're more sensitive to, um, touch or treatments. Like they, you, you know, they're just, they can't tolerate as much. Like they're telling me, you know, I, I had this treatment and it made me really sore, you know, like in the needling course, we talked about the, uh, oh gosh, I'm going to butcher it. Is it the Q I Q A S Q S T yeah. Q S T. Okay. So, yeah. yeah. Um, so, you know, you, you test those points and you kind of get this, this range, and you decide, okay, the higher range, that person's maybe more sensitive. I'm going to go a lower dose. Kind of similar. You're going to, you're just looking at their history. Um, and, and I'm kind of gauging that as I'm doing a history with them. And, uh, and as I feel them and just kind of feel how they're responding to my touch, um, you know, there, there was a, um, a patient I saw just uh, last week for the first time um, that I chose just to do I think two things uh, with her because of that reason. It was, you know, this has been going on for a long time. This is a chronic issue. Um, you're constantly in pain. I'm going to do less. But then, you know, I'll get maybe an athlete right, um, that it, they're in pain, but they're still trucking along, right? So they, they'll, I might, might push a little bit more. So, I've, uh, you know, that clinical reasoning comes into play for, for a lot of that. Yeah. So it's, I mean, to me, that sounds like it's a very patient directed approach. Like, uh, yeah, the absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. So, yeah. That's, that's how we've designed. We have that, um, our neuro release treatment course with, with IDN where it's cupping and scraping and, and more of the, the tissue kind of work. Um, and it, that's how we, that's how we push it or portray it. Right. Like mm -hmm. soft, hard, all, everything works. Right. It's just a matter of what the patient needs in that moment, kind yeah. of an idea. And it sounds like you're going the same way. Yeah, um, absolutely. I feel like I was on clinicals early in my career where it was kind of like push through everything. And it just mm -hmm. never made a lot of sense to me. Like, yeah, as a therapist, how do I know that it's safe to push through something like right. if that patient's giving me feedback, something in their systems off, whether that's emotional or, or pain related or, or whatever. Um, and I think early in my career, I probably did push, push through stuff mm -hmm. too much. Like I just doesn't, I don't know what, what, I don't know how that makes sense. Like, if it's enough to stimulate a response in their nervous system, if it's enough mm -hmm. to create a mechanical input, it's probably enough to create some kind of change, right? It's yeah. a better place to start. So interesting to, to hear even that, that you're going that same route with it. Yeah. You know, one of the things, uh, you know, if, if you ever take the Baral courses, um, a lot of times what they'll do is they'll, they'll quote, you know, Jean-Pierre Baral, who, who created that specific approach. And, and one of the things they say is, uh, and they'll do the French accent. I can't do a French accent. It'll sound <laughs> Jamaican, so I'm not even going to try. Um, Are you from you, Texas? No, um, I, I was born in South Louisiana. Um, oh, okay, okay. So like, like Cajun country. Um, hey, these, hey, I know a lot of people from Louisiana that are really good manual therapists. Is that a thing there? I have a hard time finding them. Like I have, I have family in Louisiana that I've, I've searched many times for them and uh, for there sure. are manual therapists there. And I think over the years there have been become more, but yeah, like five, 10 years ago, I had a hard time finding anybody over there. Really? At least, at least in the parts that I Chris. have family. Chris, Chris Davis, uh, Katie, okay. Louisiana. He, okay, that's, podcast with them. Yeah, that would be exactly where my, my dad's in the Lafayette area. So that's a Katie area. Uh, yeah, I'll connect you. And uh, Mike, um, oh, I'm going to butcher Mike's last name. Um, but there's another guy in the same similar area. But yeah, Chris is fantastic. They got a clinic there. They're awesome. We've done a bunch okay. of dealing courses there. Anyway, oh, nice. that's interesting. I, I mean, yeah. I just didn't like because Right. In the PT world, there's people that just don't want to talk about manual therapy anymore. So interesting it's, to hear. It's true, about. man. That's like a whole nother podcast. Yeah. Right? I don't want to, I don't want to go down that rabbit hole. I've done this before. Right. Um, anyway. Well, so, so yeah, John Pierre Barral, what he'll, you, you know, get back to what you were saying, uh, you know, he'll say, um, 
you provide a little little something and then you let the body do the rest and so it's like you, you give this little input and then you let the body take over um, and do what it's going to do and so somewhere oh, along the way somewhere along the way in my you know probably in the first five years of my career um, I remember at the very beginning I was all about I have to fix you if you don't get healed it's it's I take it personally like I didn't do something right and then somewhere along the way I started to shift to be more I, I'm in a partnership with you and your body we work together I'm I'm not responsible for fixing you um, but I'm I'm going to do everything I can to help your body to do what it can do best um, and and that kind of goes back to to what you were saying like you know like I now I don't tend to push and, and force through a whole lot um, the body's guarding that for a reason uh, so I think okay what's another way to go about it can I go somehow into a back door um, you know go around that barrier and, and still affect the nervous system but get it to let that go and so yeah I, I, I agree with you I, I see that still a lot in the mm -hmm. PT world but um, I've, I've largely moved away from that. I love, I love that explanation. Um, yeah, that that's perfect. In, in the NRT course, again, like we do all the three different tools. We do cups, we do scraping and we do percussion. And the idea yeah. is if, if somebody doesn't like one of the tools, it's not that that one tool is magic, like right. use it. If they don't like compression, switch to distraction and use, use cups. If they don't yeah. like that, do she, right. You can switch, you can, you can kind of, but I think I'm still in this phase of I, I am like I take it personal if I don't fix yeah. them. Yeah. But I know that it's not my responsibility. Like I, I'm smart enough to know that I can't enforce a change just because I want it to. Yeah. Right. I need to create a stimulus that I want your immune system to fix. Yeah. Um, but no, I still no, take it. I still take it personal. Don't get me wrong. Like I <laughs> yeah, like I if they don't get better, I feel that frustration. I'm like, yeah. dang it. Like like, oh, I say 80% better, only 80%, like get, get back on the table. We got to figure this out, <laughs> you know? So hey, that's still in me. Don't get me wrong, but. Yeah. Um, I've also learned that if it's 80% better, just let it ride for a couple of days. Cause, yeah, cause yeah. maybe, maybe that last 20 just disappears on its own. Usually. That's true. That's true. Usually. Yeah. Um, but, uh, cause I've gotten myself in trouble with that exact. Oh, get back mm -hmm. on the table. And try Over, like overdoing that. it. Yeah. yeah over treat them. Over, you overcook yeah. it in their immune system. Yes. Yeah. Um, but ah, that, yeah. Um, it's interesting to see again when, when, you know, coming at it from a visceral side of things, but the approach sounds so, so similar of let's provide the input. Let's mm -hmm. not over treat. Let's see, kind of see how it shakes. What, yeah. how did you get to, well, you know, before we do go down that rabbit okay. hole, what's the other, you mentioned that there was another side to yeah. the, the visceral. What is, what's the, what's the kind of alternate to that? Um, so, so it's where I started actually. So I started with a group called the Institute of Physical Art. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's, that's where I've gone through their program certified, but that's where I was actually, and this will get us into the question you were going to ask. That's, that's where I got introduced to the visceral world. Um, yeah, okay. and so, you know, their, their approach is very eclectic. Um, you know, it's some manual therapy, um, approaches. It's very much you know, mechanics, bone and joint, some are very heavy in soft tissue, um, but I found, you know, the Institute of Physical Art, they've, they've got a good balance between um, addressing the, the joint, the soft tissues, addressing the nerve mobility, the, neuro, the, the neurodynamics. Um, and when I was, when I was coming out of school and, and getting in with them, like they were starting, they were just kind of starting into um, working with the viscera and considering the viscera. Baral was already doing his thing, but mm -hmm. the IPA was starting to work it into their curriculum. And so, um, did you I, do their fellowship? I didn't do their fellowship. I applied to it, um, and uh, we we were all we were all set to to basically go ahead with it. And then we had a um, surprise uh, pregnancy, which is it was great. We we had gone through. Um, infertility treatments for our first. And we thought, well, you know, we don't want to go through that again. We're good with one. And so I had submitted my application, like talk to them. They're like, yeah, you're a strong candidate. And then boom. And I was like, oh, I don't know if we can afford this then. because, you know, we were going to move to Steamboat Springs, Colorado. Um, I was looking at, like, it was going to be like an extra $40,000 to take on for the year. And I was like, I just don't know if we can justify that. And so I pulled my application and um, you know, I mean, I wouldn't go back and, and change anything about it. Um, cause we've since had another, I, I've been told they're bonus babies. That's what we should say. Not, not surprised. <laughs> we've, we've since had a third 
bonus or a second bonus baby. So maybe we have three now, but um, three seems we, like three seems we, like a big number. I mean, are you, are you at one or two? We're at two. I, I I keep bugging Matt, and I'm telling him he's at two as well. I'm like, dude, you just need a third. It makes you feel younger. <laughs> he's gonna. I hope he listens to this. I hope he hears <laughs> that. <laughs> I'm tag him. Yeah, yeah. He and I had that conversation over dinner uh, while we were down there, and yeah. Uh, you know, we're in the, our youngest is four months old and our oldest okay. is two and a half. So we're kind of in the, the, like the heat of it right now. Yes. I feel like and the idea of, you know, three is three's big. Yeah, we are. We had a pretty good gap. So that helped like our, our oldest is nine and a half Our um, our middle is six and a half. And then we have a nine month old. So, you know, the nine and the six year old, they're really good about helping out where they can. I mean, we don't quite have babysitters yet, but we can at least soon. leave the room and feel comfortable for a little bit. So yeah, yeah, yeah. soon. Uh, yeah. Fun. yeah. Anyway, so you've done a lot of their coursework then, like you've kind of gone through their their program. Yeah, so they, yeah, they do a certification program. And so I went through their certification. Okay. Um, and, and, and then I was going to go to the fellowship. But um, yeah, I stopped, stopped short of that. Interesting, interesting. And so like, I'm assuming then just because of the visceral work you do kind of that, that eclectic approach, that's what kind of takes you into the private practice and seeing some of those clients, right? Like that's just gonna feed itself. Right, right, right. Absolutely. I, I, there's just a you know, there's a lot of potential that I knew, and it, a lot of it came down to because of what I saw. Yeah, I did a clinical rotation up in Steamboat Springs um, at their main clinic at the time. And, you know, just seeing some of the stuff that they treated, I was like, I didn't know that PTs could treat that. I didn't know that could be treated in general. And so just to see that, it was like, that just opened up the possibilities and uh, just the potential of what we can offer um, as as a PT, but also you know as a manual therapist in general. Um, I mean, it was it was like mind blowing. And so then, then what are some to, of those examples? Yeah. Um, I, so the very first one I remember seeing, um, uh, you know, Greg is um, Greg Johnson. He he and his wife Vicky are, are the um, creators of the Institute of Physical Arts. So I was watching Greg treat with one of his fellows, and it was a lady, and. Um, she was having uh, lower lower lumbar pain, maybe uh, SI joint pain. I can't remember. And, and you know, and, and the and these you know, all of the fellows that are getting trained, like they've all gone through this certification program already. So like they're not chumps, right? Like they're great therapists. And so if they're if they're struggling, you know, there's typically something going on there. But he comes in and um, you know they kind of go through a quick like subjective just because so he can kind of catch catch up to speed and then he goes and treats her uterus and you know just through the abdomen um just so we're clear for everybody that's looking for a visceral therapist it's you know <laughs> all of a lot of this can be done externally and is done externally so um so he goes to the lower abdomen he treats the uterus uh she has up no pain and so i remember asking him i said greg what what made you think the first time you treated a uterus I'm going to go treat that lady's uterus. And he said, well, I had a lady that, you know, I was treating her for low back pain, chronic low back pain, and it just wasn't getting better like I'd expected. So I said, or so he goes, I, I told him, let me go, let me go uh, study some anatomy and then let's get back together. So he goes and studies, he looks what's in that area. And he goes, well, this, this has got to play a role. I mean, it's got a ligament that attaches from the back of the uterus to the sacrum. And you got these ligaments that come out to the side to towards the, the um, inside of the um, pelvis. He said, this, this would make sense. Goes and treats it and it solves her, her back pain issue. Um, you know, so that was, that was one of them. Um, and then um, so probably the other, there's, there's plenty of stories, but the other probably like, mind-blowing one at the time was uh when he started treating the heart mobility um and oh, and um you know the, if it's it's a it's a fine line to walk right like so when i when i treat this kind of stuff now like it's a fine line as a pt to walk knowing what my scope of practice is so i try to tie all these visceral things to something musculoskeletal right so that way i'm treating you for mobility because of this yeah but like he would treat stuff and we would start to see things change that, you know, weren't musculoskeletal, like blood pressure decrease, anxiety decrease. And, you know, he wasn't treating them for the blood pressure. 
he wasn't treating him for the anxiety because you know pts we don't do that right but but he he was treating it knowing that these things could potentially be affected but this person was having some other musculoskeletal issues or, or you know mechanical restrictions that led him to consider that and so yeah those those were kind of the the two eye-opening mind-blowing ones uh, that i remember that's an interesting one. I don't, that's something that I like the visceral stuff makes a lot of sense. I've had a few of those ahas myself, yeah. the heart mobility. I mean, you talk about vagus nerve, right? Like, mm -hmm. yeah, pretty interesting. You know, as far as autonomic change. And, and that, absolutely. Right? Absolutely. Yeah, that's, that's kind of interesting. Wow. Um, so what kind of, I, don't, <laughs> I mean, I don't, want, I don't want to touch that one. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know where we go with it, but yeah. like, if we were, if we were in person, I'd be like, show me something. <laughs> like, show me yeah, these techniques. Yeah. yeah. Uh, um, I, I mean, I just love the, uh, you know, exercise is obviously vitally important. And, and from a mm -hmm. treatment standpoint, you need it. But anybody that's done manual therapy for a while, those ahas are like, mm -hmm. you're not going to, like, what are you going to do to exercise that out? Right. Like, yeah. You put some input, you let the person's nervous and immune system kind of do their thing. And then all of a sudden the pain just disappears. Right. And right, right. input, right time. It's, it's, I mean, it is crazy stuff. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. And that's, you know, and I, and I think you would, you would probably agree with this. I'm like, it's not to negate that the exercise is still a very important you part it. of it. Yes. You know, you absolutely, you talked about motor programming or motor learning, right? Like you, you need to retrain, retrain that, but you're right. Like, it, it just made perfect sense to me early on. I'm like, why wouldn't I try to correct something that's not moving well, that's affecting how well you can even do these exercises? You know, I mean, how many times do we have people that come in? They're like, yeah, I tried physical therapy. It didn't work. Well, what did that look like for you? Yeah, you know, they gave me a bunch of exercises and, you know, it just didn't help. Well, let's take a look. What's missing? And then you start digging a little bit deeper and you find, hey, this is restricted. And that's going to affect, like you talked about earlier, right? Like we know inflammation we know um alignment issues we know that um you know a lack of movement can affect how well the neuromuscular components of the system function and so maybe those muscles aren't firing well because of this restriction we free this restriction up now those exercises might work a little better for you so yeah definitely not you know and, and i try to tell people that like when they when we talk manual therapy like when i have a student or something like our goal is to get them to the point where they can do stuff like that. But you're right. Like those aha moments, like just, it just, it's like, why wouldn't you do that? Why wouldn't you consider yeah. that? Yeah. Especially. Yeah. I mean, and like, you're exactly what you're saying. You're going to move around a, an inhibited or a guarded muscle because of pain. You're going to move around it. Like how, yeah. how are you supposed yeah. to activate it? And, and if your body's guarding it that hard, why would you activate it? Right. Like, right. Let's take away the, let's take away the guarding and then see what, we'll see what shakes. Um, it, I don't know. It makes sense to me. That's kind of my, bias my background but mm -hmm. um it's it's so painful when you hear people say manual therapy is garbage and you're just like come on, come on. i know and you you've Burns. kind of alluded your your some of your uh manual therapy background being mulligan so you're gonna i mean mm -hmm. like that's great stuff like i've i was taught some of that early on too and i was like this makes perfect sense and it works right? it's like, all ahas like it's yeah. all magic yes like yeah. you, you put this little bit of pressure on their neck and then they're like my neck pain's gone what did you yes. just do <laughs> Was it, what is it? Moons, nags, and snags, right? Yeah. 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 yeah MWMs. And yeah. Um, my first year as a PT, like I was fresh out of school and somebody brought me a magic hat as a gift on their discharge day. <laughs> nice. it, it, like, like that person was happy, right? Like, and yeah. it was just some yeah. stupid mulligan thing that works yeah. so well. Um, yes. it, uh, yeah. And then obviously the needling side. And, and mm. before we run out of time here, I at least want to hint at the needling. How did you yeah. end up? Because that's the needling yeah. is another thing where you get some ahas. Yes. Um, yeah. How did you end up at a needling course? Like what got you there? Um, I knew I was going to do needling. Um, I've known I've been doing it for a while. Like I knew it's a good compliment to what I do. I purposely was holding off um, because at, at the time in in the clinic I was in, nobody was doing it at that point. Like, so we're talking five to eight years ago. And so, and it was a busy clinic and I knew whoever did it first was going to get pulled into every patient that needed to be needled. And I am very yep. protective of what I do. Uh -huh. um, and I, I like to spend that time with the patient and, you know, and I would still get called into rooms like, Hey, can you come and check this out? Um, like I do, I, I do a lot of pelvic work. And so I would, I, I joked, oh, if it was the right patient, I joked, you know, 
I would get called into the room to check a tailbone. I'm like, hey, I'm Jason. I'm the guy that comes and looks at your butt and then leaves. <laughs> like, because I was constantly getting pulled into the room for that. So like that was already happening. I'm like, I can't add in something else that's going to pull me away from the patients that are coming to see me. So I purposely didn't do it. But then we started having more therapists go through it and, and different, different needling programs, right? Like mm-hmm. honestly integrative was not even on my radar. Didn't know it was out there. Um, I was, I was looking at it like, oh, I'll probably do this one. Um, and then, um, a, a colleague of mine who was a former student of mine did integrative and she's like, Hey, this fits our model and our mindset really well. I think you need to consider doing this one. And so, and, and then one of those therapists was started to, um, dry needle up at, uh, for, with PT and she started dry needling my patients. And I was like, dude, like, this is making a difference and I need to learn this now. Um, so, you know, I was planning on traveling for it. And then Matt was like, why don't we just try to host it? Like, why don't we? So, <laughs> uh, so it worked out, it worked out well. That's pretty yeah. cool that that's how, that's how you got connected. Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, talking to you, I could tell, like, I, you know, again, I know our course and like, it matches your philosophy it matches mm-hmm. your philosophy very closely yes. as far as neural input and how it affects the system and, and, and those kinds of things. So before we hopped on, you said you had started needling a little bit. Um, how's it going? What, what kind of stuff are you noticing? Uh, yeah, it's been good. Um, you know, I, I, I tend to have this method when I take like a, a course that's a new approach where you know, the first week or so, it's really just, I'm like, I'm going through the different techniques. Like I'm, I'm breaking it down and just, I, do, I need to remember the techniques, how to do it, where to do it, you know, things like that. And so, you know, this last week, week and a half, that's largely been, it was, you know, trying to, okay, as I'm treating patients, I'm thinking, okay, I could put a needle there because of this or this, I would maybe put them here. And so then I just start, you know, the patients that are appropriate and are okay with it. That's what I've started doing. Uh, so, you know, some lower body stuff, some, upper, I actually already had a lady let me needle her face. <laughs> she was like, I've got this weird ear stuff that's been going on. Like you treated the cranium last time and it kind of helped, but it's still going on. I'm like, well, I learned some stuff. Let's try it. <laughs> and uh, so she was good with it. Um, and then, you know, and, and as that, as that gets more comfortable, then I'll start, you know, kind of integrating. Okay. Like, okay, there's this whole approach that I have to now, uh, integrated in. Uh, so I'll, I'll kind of start thinking about it more as, um, okay, I'm needling here, but I'm also going to needle these other places because of how this affects the nerve or the nervous system. And, and then, and then after that, it's really going to be, okay, now how do I fully integrate this into what, it, you know, I'm already doing and not just be like, Hey, this is the side deal, but now it becomes a part of the whole approach. Yeah, I'd be interested to have this conversation again with you in a couple of months. Yeah, um, that'd be good. Your we quote, your, your quote, yeah, we should. Your quote um, from Baral about apply a stimulus and then let the body kind of like, I, I feel like in a way that's exactly what we're saying with needling, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, I, right. We get, we get heat all the time because people want to know, well, if I put the needle in, does it activate the muscle or deactivate the muscle? Does it like, it does what it does. Like the immune system is yeah. going to react, yeah. right? The, the yeah. person's body is going to react and you know, wherever their body takes it, that's what's going to, you know, you're just creating a stimulus. Right. And so I feel like that quote, it matches kind of um, exactly what, what our model kind of entertains. And as you get more comfortable, I have to imagine that it's just like the blend. I'm, I'm really curious to see how you, you know, we call it that fourth generation where you kind of, yes, yes. you kind of integrate it into your own stuff. I can't wait to see, what your what your model looks like yeah. um we yeah, also we, go ahead i was gonna say we, we should we should definitely do this uh, you know like this podcast that you're doing i, I kind of had started one like like this um last year i just kind of i didn't have the time to keep it up but i'll resurrect it at some point and we'll do this and we'll talk needling a little bit more and then yeah that'll be good yeah i don't i don't have time to do it either it gets all kind of crazy but it is fun just to like <laughs> you know especially you know as you get into like having your own private practice like there's only so many people to talk to you know like right, as far as like right. just talking shop and hearing what other people are doing you kind of get into your own you get into your own rhythm and and you know what works for you but i so the one of the bigger fascial or visceral ones that i've had i had a younger kid uh high school age had uh his appendix removed and then after his appendix removed, every time he went to the bathroom, every time he peed, he would get like penile pain. He'd get pain mm-hmm. and like, mm-hmm. 
like, all right, what happened? Did they nick anything? No, nerves work. Everything's fine. All right. Why is this? Like, what is this pain? You know? And uh, Mark Hernandez, who teaches our pelvic mm -hmm. floor course, I, I emailed him. And I'm like, what am I missing here? And uh, the, um, oh, what's the ligament comes out of the belly button? Uh, uh, the, uh, developmental the, ligament. Oh, the, uh, like the um, umbilical cord or the umbilical ligament? It's, it's one of the umbilical ligaments. It has a fancy name. Uracus. Um, maybe, maybe. It attaches to the bladder. Yes, uh, it's connected to the bladder. Yeah. Yeah. And so Mark's like, throw a cup on his belly button. So we put a cup on his belly button. We mobilize it. Yeah. Pain gone. Never comes back. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's like, like, oh, that's so cool. Like that stuff is just so wild to me. Um, and it's just the more you learn about how all the neurology connects and in that fascial piece and the developmental ligaments there's, there's a part of like that. That's it's a, it's a piece, right. And, and how does it, like you're saying, how does it all fit into the, the treatment perspective is, I think it's an evolving concept, but uh, pretty cool. So something as a side note, but something I think you'll find cool. Um, you, you know, you mentioned the developmental, um, ligaments and, and these structures that are there. So one of the ways that, um, you can also assess, uh, the, um, the health or the vitality, I think they say, of, of an organ is, so there's this inherent movement um, that happens. It's, it's, it's a subtle movement. Like, um, you know, if you were to put a live MRI on, like it's it's not anything that you would see, but it's, it's a very subtle movement towards midline and away from midline. And so what it is, is, you know, when we were developing, we were very much midline, right? And so then as we, as we grow um, and develop, then we became more, uh, we kind of opened up. And so all these structures that started more midline, now they start to move away from midline. And it's like this, like the body has this memory of where we came from and where we went. And so a healthy, uh, vibrant organ is going to have good movement. Um, so, and this is different from a cranial sacral rhythm, but it's kind of a similar concept, right? Like there's a subtle rhythm that you're feeling. And so you can assess like if I if I took we'll take the liver because it's it's a big structure like so it would move up and out and down and in and if let's say that let's say I had an abdominal surgery and there's a scar that's holding that liver I'm going to feel that movement not come up and out as much because it's being held here even though I'm not physically taking the liver and moving it so it's like it's like our body has these memories of where we came from which is to me like the more I learn about anatomy and the more that I learn about, um, you know, the embryological development and, and how that affects us later on, like, it's just amazing. Like, and, and, like the body is, it's, it's very well designed, right? It's an amazing design. Yep. And I think in an effort to simplify it, we mess it up sometimes, right? Like, sure. Like we got to identify the pathology. And once we have that pathology, we know everything, but yeah the consequences of that pathology are complicated. Like there's layers to it. Like you're saying, mm -hmm. um, those primitive reflexes, those embryonic right. reflexes, right. When, you, when things get really stressed, like, where do you go? You know, right. um, the autonomic nervous system side of posturing and tension, uh, it's just, how does that all fit into, and then, you know, take it next level of central sensitization and effects on the brain and the spinal cord mm -hmm. with, with systemic, the chemical side of the whole, right. The chemical inflammatory yeah. side of this whole equation. Um, you know, how does that fit into the autonomics and, and some of those, uh, you know, sure. I'd be curious how many of those people where you're seeing some of those primitive guarding kind of patterns of the viscera also have systemic inflammatory problems, autoimmune mm -hmm. conditions, the, that kind of yeah. stuff. I wonder if it goes together. Yeah, I think it does. Um, I mean, at this point, that's largely what I see. Like it, it, when, it, when mm -hmm. I started out, um, treating the viscera, like I was seeing like a general orthopedic population, like I would see high school athletes or, um, you know, weekend warriors or, you know, just like younger population to old population. Um, and so even like one, I remember it was a high school cross country player. Like he had, he was, he was in a meet, he stepped in a pothole, kind of did one of these and kept going, had this side pain. And I think it, I think it was right side pain. And, uh, you know, he, he continued, he was like, 13 something but um you know he just had this nagging pain when he would run like he would get to a certain uh level of intensity and he would start to have this pain again um but it turns out it, his ascending colon was what had tightened up on him when he had that jolt into that um pothole so like the, the visceral work 
works for even like a more acute injury, somebody that's young and healthy. Um, Cause that's where I started, right? Like I started looking at it as, Hey, that hip pain's not getting better. It's been there for a while. There might be, you know, something that's tight viscerally. And then as I started to develop a little bit more, then it was more like, okay, now these chronic issues where there's, um, you know, inflammation involved, autoimmune um, um, conditions that are involved, that, that there's this constant inflammatory process going on. Yeah, like it, it, those things are, are or starting to be effective. I mean, we know 70, 70% of the immune system is found in the gut. And so if you think I've got an autoimmune system, the immune system's dysfunctional at that point, uh, it, it would make sense for things to tighten up through there. So I find that all the time. Um, one of my, one of my biggest referrals, right. Referral sources right now is from a naturopath, um, up the road that that's a lot of what, what she's sending my way is when, when people come in and she does, um, uh, her test specifically, there's a stool test um, that she does when it shows up with certain things. Like she's like, let's go see Jason and see if there's a mechanical restriction. Um, and then the, over the last probably few years where I started really kind of getting into it is um, emotional trauma and how that manifests physically in our organs. And so I've been seeing more of that. And so like it started off like, let me treat this because you're young and healthy and it didn't get better. And then now it's evolved for me into you've got a lot going on and we need to consider all of these layers that affect it. Um, but it, it works across the spectrum for sure. That's yeah. The, the young case, the first thing that pops into my head is how many times does that kid end up having some surgery? Like yeah, doesn't get better right. with conservative PT. They go in, they do an image of his hip. He's got a labral tear because everybody's got labral tears. And then right. he gets a labor repair. And sure. it, you know what I yeah. mean? Like, yeah. Uh, how often or, or spine, right? Like, yes. Oh, look, yeah. we found a disc bulge. Well, yeah. Okay. Um, right. And it, you know, when you talk about people ask, oh, don't you just love your job? And when people get better, like, yeah, but the ones I remember are the ones where you go, what if I miss something? Right. Yes. Like, yes. what if I missed a week, you know, not that that's the norm, but what if I missed, a weird visceral thing or, or weird systemic inflammatory referral or, um, yeah, it's a tricky one. Um, mm -hmm. are you seeing, so this, this is what drove me into the looking at viscera was the autoimmune stuff because mm -hmm. the basic stuff gets better, right? Like right. somebody comes in with normal back pain, kind of the common causes, you know, at this point I expect them to get better pretty quick. Um, or I'm missing something. Right. And mm -hmm. so that's kind of where I want, got into the, like looking at the visceral stuff, mm -hmm. how effective are you seeing like people with just like chronic belly pain and they have, you know, they have digestive issues called mm -hmm. gluten sensitivity, allergy, whatever, you know, leaky gut stuff, but then like their stomach always hurts, you know, yeah. they can't put pants on, they can't, you know, they're wearing loose fitting shirts. Um, are you seeing, changes in digestive habits and then i mean i would assume if that gets better then the belly tenderness goes away but are you seeing yeah. some of those things yes um so I, I see i see it go a couple ways probably the majority of people are on the constipated side right mm -hmm. um or maybe they're bloated maybe they get bloating after they eat certain foods um so like for the constipation issue i'm seeing you know when we treat this stuff it at the very least temporarily changes um, the bowel function to where the stools are maybe a little bit softer, the frequency maybe increases a little bit more, the volume of the um, bowel movements increase. Um, so at the very least we see that. Now, where it gets tricky for me is there's so many factors at play and a lot of these people have other factors that are playing into it that just kind of brings that right back. And so, you know, I, I very much emphasize the team approach um, to treatment with those kinds of patients. And, you know, you know, I can address this aspect of it, but you're going to need somebody to address that aspect of it, the, you know, the, the dietary aspect of it, or, um, you know, the, you know, prescribe you some supplements or, you know, something that's going to help you get the leaky gut condition solved. So, but in general, yes. I mean, you, like the visceral work will affect constipation. I've seen it go the other way around too, where like one lady I had, she, she didn't tell me this. I was treating her for hip pain. Um, 
chronic hip pain, but like part of the treating her was treating through the viscera. And she was like, you know, I noticed that for years, my stools have been loose, like almost to the point of diarrhea. She goes, they're solid again. And I'm like, you didn't tell me that. So I've, I've seen it go both ways and the bloating, same thing, like bloating a lot of times, um, the small intestines can be a huge part of that. Uh, with all the vessels, lymphatics, and, and all that that goes with that. So I am seeing that, but, you know, for some people, it's, for some people, it does resolve. For other people, it's, uh, and I think you kind of mentioned you had a case with a needling lady, like she just kind of comes in like every six to eight weeks at this point. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it was your, your dystonia lady, I think is what you were talking mm -hmm. about. You know, I've got people like that. And then for other people, it really, it becomes part of how they choose to manage um, what's going on. Because for some people, you know, like we, we, we can't reverse everything. Right. And so for some people, it's my goal is to avoid surgery. My goal is to fill up my best. And this is part of it. Um, and so I might see them, you know, once every couple of weeks to once a month or something like that to just do some things up like that. Tune, tune up sessions, tune ups. Yep. Tune ups, body tune ups. I think. Yes. Yeah. But yeah. I'm becoming a bigger, you know, in, in conventional insurance-based PT, you don't get to do tune-ups because insurance no. doesn't allow it. Yeah. Now that we've been, ca I mean, we're going on five years now, um, say what you want, but the value of the tune-ups, like people like them because yeah. they feel good and, and they're no medications and they're, you know, right. um, and, and it just kind of keeps them moving well. So yeah, definitely. It opens up a lot of interesting aspects and, and I think you're going to see, I think that's why you're seeing the popularity of in the PT world of going cash because- mm -hmm we have such a skill set as a profession that we're just kind of held back on a little bit when you only get three visits and it's all post-surgical care and, and, and that right. kind of stuff. So it's, it's uh, yeah, again, that's a topic for a whole nother podcast. Yes. Too, yeah, absolutely. The whole, the whole health of the profession, right? Like that's a whole right. Thing, but anyway, Hey man, this was fun. I really enjoyed kind of yeah. talking shop. Um, my poor clients are about to get their bellies pushed on a lot more again. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> just just know what's underneath what you're pushing on right that's that's what i tell people I'm like you just got to consider what's underneath that's all. yeah well you, i have a client you the so right have you seen this thing it's, yes uh, yeah he's yeah. like what do you think about this i was like i think it's going to mobilize your colon that's what i think yeah <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, absolutely but people love it right it does they it do. does good stuff yeah. Um, yeah so no and we do some abdominal needling and, and some different things yeah. that are pretty in, like from the neural side, the input side, that that's just fast. So there's so many layers. Um, I also want you at some point to, uh, we'll have to connect you. Maybe we can do a, a, a big podcast with Mark Hernandez because he oh, does a lot of- I'm going to take, take his course stuff. at some point. You're going to like that course. Um, yeah. I just know you will. And it'd be it'd be really interesting to, to kind of get a conversation um, with a bunch of different, like a, almost like a get a bunch of manual therapists and just kind of talk about all the nuances. It'd be real fun. We'll yeah, figure, figure out a way to do that yeah so i like to wrap up all the podcasts with what do you think you're going to be most interested in next year or things you want to learn or dive into where do you think you're heading um i, I mean i want to take the advanced course for sure so um yeah. and I, I've, I've already started looking at that but um you know, prior to getting into the needling a week, a week ago, uh, I was actually looking <laughs> at um, a couple things. Um, for years, I've wanted to go through the certification process for the visceral work. Um, the thing I've been held back on the most is, um, you know, not the practical side of it. It's I have to write up 10 case studies. And so I just I have not had the time to do that. And if I'm being honest, I still won't have the time to do it, but I'm gonna try to make that happen. Mm -hmm. um, so that'd be one. But then I, I had also started looking into um, functional medicine certification, like a functional medicine practitioner certification. Um, you know, more at this stage for the knowledge of it, but um, I might I might go that route with it just to just to keep learning. Yeah, I did a podcast with a naturopathic doctor out of out of Canada. And it is interesting just to hear the little nuances, difference in, in their training and, and some of the stuff that um, I don't know that it opens up any like, I hate that we can't order x rays and, and right. like, it doesn't really open those doors for you. But the knowledge, I think of right. kind of understanding some of the, um, you know, herbal stuff and some other things might be might mm -hmm. be interesting. That's really cool. Um, I'm glad you enjoyed the needling course. Obviously, yeah. you know, uh, I, I'm I, I would love to see again. Let's have this conversation in a couple of yeah, months. We'll give um, a few months for sure. Let let you talk a little bit about what you're finding and how it's you know kind of getting into your system. I think it'll be fun. Yeah, that'd so, be interesting. 
All right, Jason, where can people find out more about you? Uh, yeah, so um, my uh, practice website is, the, the name of the company is R3 Physio, the letter R and the number three. Uh, so www.r3physio.com. Um, and then Instagram and Facebook. Um, I'm not I'm not a huge social media fan, but I do my best to keep up with it, um, mostly on Instagram stories, probably. Uh, so at R3 Physio for those true of all of us pts we're, we're right. all trying we're all trying to learn social media yeah yeah all right man this was fun thank you thanks again yeah, absolutely thanks for watching and supporting the channel we hope you enjoyed this week's episode let us know in the comments below what you liked what you disliked what you'd like to hear more of and any questions we can help answer we appreciate your support and we look forward to seeing you on the next one